Amen. We give God thanks always for everything. And in times like these, especially so, we also, we want to give thanks to the governor of this state of Georgia. There are a lot of things he could have said that would have made it impossible for us to meet today. But they left some room open for us so that we can meet in a sensible way. And we thank God for that. There is no need for us to complain about the times and the seasons because things happen. And we give God thanks that we can still praise his name. And for those who are at home, we pray that you follow along and you worship the Lord. That is from Casita Road Church of Christ that you have the Lord's Supper, and when the time comes that you will participate with us. Today we want to talk about the Lord's Supper, looking especially at two scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 34, and Luke 22, 14 through 20. We will not read those passages today because uh, time is not on our hand, but we want to make it that you'll understand what is taught in these passages. The public ministry of Jesus has come to a close. It is as if there is a crisis in the lives of his disciples. He's about to leave, but he is not just leaving, he is having with them the last supper, uh, the, 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 the supper that they're supposed to have, that Passover supper. And he is now introducing something to them. You see, the Passover, of course, was a reminder to the Jews of what Christ had done back in Egypt. So this was a kind of memorial for them, but now Christ introduces his own memorial by having this feast. And this feast we call uh, the Communion. So on this, the night of his betrayal, the master entered into a large upper room of some house in the city of Jerusalem. It was in this place that he met with his disciples, Peter, James, John, and others, to bid them farewell, to eat the Passover with them the last time, and to institute the Lord's Supper. The occasion, of course, was one of sadness, and at the same time, one of sweetness. Around the Feast of the Lord's Supper, the Christian worship was built or is built. The biblical portion before us of the origin of this sacred institution should not be forgotten. With four meaningful words, we want to describe it. Notice with me in, in Luke chapter 22 and verse number 19. First, this supper is a memorial. Jesus says, this do in remembrance of me. To the Jews, this should not be a surprise or a new doctrine. One would read Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15, and there you would find that Moses said to the children of Israel, that they are to eat the law, uh, that they are to keep the Passover, and not only that, the reason why God gave them the Sabbath was in memory of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. Now, just imagine the Jew not keeping the Sabbath because there are no ifs and there are no buts. They had to keep the Sabbath or, this would die, or they would die. This was in remembrance of their deliverance. Here we have a greater than Moses. And he institutes a supper. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. The question before us should be, what did the disciples think about this? Of course, he, he had the bread. The bread reminds us of his body, the fruit of the vine of his blood. We partake because we remember him and also to nourish the memory of him. By these memories, we nourish and cherish 
our lives are ruled and regulated. How important it is, therefore, that we keep alive in our hearts the most precious memories. A memory of the Savior helps to build our lives around him. Number two, this meal or this, this, this feast is a communion. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. What does that word mean? What does it imply? It's a communication, an intercourse, if you please. A communion brings us into a more intimate relationship with the person with whom we commune. So then, when we commune with Christ, remember, Christ says that he will eat this with us or drink this with us until he comes again. So he is in our presence. When we think of this, what Christ instituted with his disciples and for us, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, the communion is twofold in nature. Number one, we commune with the Lord. He is a silent and unseen um, communicant at the table. Remember, it is the Lord's table. We commune not only with the Lord, but with one another. He says, when you come together to eat, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 33. So again, you see the importance that we commune together because there is a relationship here. And at the head of this relationship is Jesus Christ. Number three, it is a proclamation. Remember what he says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You think for a minute. It, when we refuse to part participate in this supper, we are not proclaiming the Lord's death. But when we participate, we are proclaiming the Lord's death. Here again the question is asked. For he said, as often as he eat this bread, how often? We go back to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. The disciples came together on the first of the week to break bread. Again, how often? On the first of the week. To do what? To break bread. Till when? Till he comes again. And in the process of partaking, we are proclaiming the Lord's death. You see, the death of Jesus is the supreme expression of divine love. The depth of it, the breadth of it, the height of it, and the length of it. Now the children used to sing a song about, about the love of God. It is so high, so low, so wide. So high, you can't get above it. So low, you can't get under it. So wide, you can't get around it. And so when we meet to commune, we are talking about being with Jesus, of his love, of his supreme love. So just think for a moment. Again, when we observe the Lord's Supper, we proclaim to the world the love of God. Though silent, it is a, a, a powerful proclamation. And then number four, it is an anticipation. Listen, till he comes. That's, that's the reason for it, till he comes. When he comes, he'll be here in person. There is no need to do anything in remembrance of. He will be with us and we will be with him. Listen, listen. The sacred supper takes our attention to the past and also to the future. The observance of it is an expression of faith and also of hope. God's people entertain a wonderful expectation. They eat with their faces toward the rising sun. Listen. The observance of the Lord's Supper should be preceded by self-examination. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28. Examine before eating and drinking. Know what this is all about. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we know that around us today there are so many who are claiming to worship the Lord. But note carefully, listen, if you are not participating in the Lord's Supper, you are not worshiping the Lord. You may be having a devotion, wonderful, but don't use words that do not um, apply to your devotion. Worship must involve partaking of the Lord's Supper. It must. Because this is what it's all about. It's in remembrance of the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the coming again of Jesus Christ. That's what the Lord's Supper is about. So if you're not partaking, it doesn't matter what an eldership or what anyone says, you're not worshiping. And it is true that worshiping is not just done in this building where we are. It could be done at home under these circumstances. But be careful that when this is over, this crisis is over, that you begin to say, well, I can worship at home. No, you can't. Not if there is, uh, there is not a, there is not a crisis. If there's a crisis like we have today, yes, it is possible because of fear and because of common sense. But if these don't exist, don't you go from here today and say that, well, I can worship at home when I feel like I don't have to be with anyone, everyone. No, you are not communing. <laughs> because communion involves other folk and it involves Christ. So we need to keep this in mind. So again, here's a question for you to ask, for us to ask and you to answer. Are you in the kingdom? If you're in the kingdom, then the table is there. If you're not in the kingdom, all this don't matter because the communion of the Lord's Supper is for those in the kingdom. Listen, Luke 22 and 29 and 30. Christ says, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You got to be in the kingdom. Next again, another question. Have I life? The dead shall not sit at feasts. Have I known the Lord? If not, how can I eat and drink in his memory? Am I clean? How unbecoming to eat with filthy hands. Penitence and prayer should, pre, uh, should precede the observance. Have I appetite? Unless we delight in the feast, it will not profit. This is not just an order or another law. This is something in which we delight. We love to because this reminds us of what Christ has done for us and what he is doing right now. You think of what, what he told his disciples before he left this earth. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. To whom is he talking? To those in his kingdom, to his children. I go to prepare a place for you. But let's ask a question now. While he is gone, what should we be doing? Remembering him in the feast that he himself instituted the Lord's Supper. Then finally, am I aware of the Lord's presence? That each time I sit and I eat of this bread, this unleavened bread, and the drink of this fruit of the vine, I'm remembering the Lord's presence. He is with us. He is eating and drinking with us. What precious company it's not just you and I who are here today or wherever you are, but we are in the presence of Jesus. He is here with us. We can't see him, but we know based on his word, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. He is here with us, and by faith we know that he is eating with us. 
Yes, he eats and he drinks with us. Listen, adding to the sweetness and the joy of this occasion. Are you a Christian? Are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? Are you a member of the body of Christ? If not, all we have said means nothing. Because what we have said this morning is for those who saw it fit to have Christ in their lives by their belief in him, by their repentance from sins, their confessing his name and being baptized into him. When we think, listen carefully, of the two main observance of the Christian. Think of them. Two of them that reminds us of the death of Christ. It is baptism and the Lord's table. Romans chapter 6. Baptism and the Lord's table. Verses 3 and 4. When we do this, it reminds us of the death and the burial of Christ and his resurrection. For Paul would say, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we should also be in the likeness of his resurrection, Romans 6 and verse 5. And then the Lord's Supper. It's natural. After baptism, here is the continuation of remembering Christ in his supper. Wherever you are this morning, we invite you to come to Christ. Form an alliance with him through obedience to the gospel of Christ, one that you'll never regret, one that doesn't matter what happens in life, it doesn't matter what, whatever happens in life, you would not be taken aback because you know that one day Christ is going to come for us and we're not going to face any of these things anymore. So we invite you to come to Christ. Whatever your needs are, come as together we stand and sing.